Hi, and welcome to Minus Investing. Today we're going to be taking a look at Silver Corp Metals, ticker SVM. Silver Corp is a major low cost producer of silver and other base metals that also has a major opportunity to expand into gold and the other precious metal spaces outside of China. I'm very excited to take a look at this company and also explain some of the risks associated with it. Let's take a look. Please like the video. It's the best way you can help us with the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to the channel if you've not already. Also, consider joining our free Discord. The link is in the description below. All right, so let's hop right into the company presentation. Uh, Silver Corp is a pretty interesting company. It came to my attention initially uh, after being recommended by a few major natural resource uh, analysts and investors that I like to pay attention to, including Rick Rule and Eric Mushinsky. Uh, whether or not those names matter to either of you guys um, but that, that at least put the ticker kind of on my radar and then i also found it to be extremely underpriced uh, with some pricing analysis which i'll show you guys in a moment after we cover some of the details related to the company itself um, but they as you can see here are a well-positioned company with a large amount of net cash positioning as well as a decent amount of uh, marketable securities in other mining companies pretty significant portion of ownership, 27% ownership in a company, New Pacific, which gives them a uh, potential other uh, diversification outside of their major operating regions. New Pacific themselves operates in Bolivia. Uh, so they're working on potentially incubating opportunities there. Uh, but then they have their core mining assets, which are focused on China. I would come over here, take a look at the map of uh, where their operations are. Primarily their biggest source of their operations is in the Ying Mining District in Hunan as well as a BYP and the GC mines as well in Guangdong province. Uh, they've been operating here for quite a long period of time. And they have a significant amount of life remaining, 15 plus years, um, which obviously leads to some questions about past the 10 year projection point, just how many years of life are remaining, which uh, in my model, we'll go over how we uh, relate the reserves to a uh, projection of how much life would be left in the, the, the model after our projected period, and therefore what kind of multiple we put on the company that relates to that. Now, one of the reasons why I found this to be an interesting opportunity in the first place is because of it being a Chinese operator. Now, it's uh, no secret if you've been watching plenty of my content that in general, I have my uh, hesitations and my concerns about operations uh, for companies in China. Uh, my issues with China generally has to do with not trusting their government and their legal system in terms of being uh, ruling in favor of capital owners in particular. And then I also have concerns about the Chinese economy in particular related to uh, some of the more authoritarian ways that they run their government and how that affects their economy, but especially uh, demographic concerns that I, I see for them in the future. So in general, my concerns about China is that I don't really want to uh, own companies that sell products to the Chinese consumer. And I'm very concerned about industries that I think, um, that I think are likely to have major amounts of regulation from the government or major restrictions, as well as I'm not, not trusting of, uh, some, uh, some operators within China, uh, depending on their relations to the government. Uh, so now this company, I, I'm talking about its operations in China, but it's actually a Canadian company. They're on the uh, Toronto exchange, TSX, as well as they're on the New York uh, stock exchange. They're dual listed, um, but this is a Canadian operated company that just has their operations primarily in China. So that uh, kind of alleviates some of my concerns right there, as well as the fact that it's a silver mining company. Um, silver is a global commodity. So the, the metal is sold onto the global uh, the, the global uh, market itself. And while China is a major customer for silver and the fact that they have a large amount of the smelting operations there, that's true for lots of natural resources. And that uh, my concerns about the Chinese economy has to do more with the higher levels of, of operations and consumer products and discretionary products and things like that, much less so than the natural resources um, themselves, a, a little bit less concerned in that regard. So this particular company doesn't really strike it at the issues that I have when it comes to uh, Chinese operations or Chinese companies and stuff like that. Um, it actually creates a, a significant uh, benefit because of the fact that they're so close to the smelters, as I was just saying. A significant portion of of the smelting operations for lots of natural resource metals is in china so a lot of uh, companies for example in the copper industry they uh, mine the metals and then they ship it to china to have the smelting done and then it's shipped back out to uh, be used in other materials in other countries so if you're already close to the, your customers and you're close to your suppliers it makes a relatively low cost uh, environment for their operations 
coming down here to this chart, it actually shows just how how much this is reflected in their actual numbers. Uh, we have the EBITDA margin for Silver Corp for the trailing 12 months, about 42%. You can see this going back uh, well over 10 years. Uh, for the last 10 years, kind of on average, I'd say it kind of ends up being in this like 40, 45% range uh, pretty consistently. Uh, in general and you can compare that to the peer group which would be other silver miners in, in general which right now is 22 percent but looks like on averages maybe 25 percent or something like that vanguard industrial is much lower than that and then gdx which is the gold and silver miners uh, uh etf is higher than the their peer group but less so than uh, silver corp as well it also shows that they are outperforming on return on equity but that's a little bit less um important to trying to make the projections uh, that i'm going to be making for for us, but this EBITDA margin, very, very useful information to kind of keep in mind in the shows that it's not just a theory that they have low cost productions, they actually really do. Coming down to the next slide, you can see that they are also trading relatively cheap compared to a lot of major silver producers and an average of their peer group, both on EV to EBITDA basis, PE to adjusted earnings. Although I have my questions about some of the uh, earnings they're using relative for their peer groups, because it seems like they use an adjusted earnings for themselves, but maybe not using adjusted earnings for their peer groups based off of the high levels of the multiples. But either way, kind of wanted to mention that here. Uh, and then somewhat of the same thing for price to operating cash flows. Although, like I said, I, I found them to be underpriced on pricing metrics in general as well. Now, next, we're going to talk about this uh, transaction that they have available to them, this opportunity that is one of the other reasons that I'm very interested in the company. Um, now, they are major silver producers we're talking about, but there is some one of uh, uh, questions about what type of runway would exist for them into perpetuity, as we were talking about. And so they've been looking to solve this. They have their large cash position, and they've actually put some of that cash to work um, by going out and making a large transaction with a major gold exploring company by the name of Orcorp, which is an Australian company. Uh, they have, uh, this company has already done all of the explorations in uh, Tanzania properties and has also gotten all of the permits with the government and is basically just set to mine and is really just looking for a significant amount of capital to get their mines operating uh, and to keep them floating relative to them. And this works well with Silver Corp needing to diversify outside of China, um, both for uh, Chinese concern relations as well as the, the, the material supply as we were just talking about. Um, so this particular Operation is expected to produce its first commercial gold in the second half of 2025. Uh, we'll be making our projections, uh, you know, back and forth based off of what uh, point in time we really think that that's going to be coming up to. And they're expecting to get up to about a quarter of a million of ounces of gold of annual production a year once the mine is fully operational. Again, kind of in question of how much time it's going to take for that to come into in question. I've adjusted my valuation for uh, the issuance of the share that is related to this. So you can assume that that's already been handled in question. Uh, and you could also uh, point out the fact that they chose to issue shares rather than to uh, pay for this through cash or debt, um, which you could argue is maybe not the greatest of choices considering I'm going to find them to be a little bit undervalued. But at the same time, I do think that this allows them to have the money on hand to be able to put the operations in place and not have to go to the debt markets and get up to high interest rates in order to do so. So I consider it a kind of a worthwhile thing. You see these choices in mining companies all the time to hold on to cash to make sure that they have the capital on hand and not have to get high interest debt in general. Uh, so uh, as I kind of was already hinting at with the benefits to the, the Silver Corp shareholders is going to be a, a pretty significant increase to their net asset value. It provides pretty immediate geographic and metal diversification from silver to gold and then from China to Tanzania, though it is worth noting that Tanzania is a relatively uh, risky place to operate for a lot of places. And this diversification could create opportunities for them to get a re-rating uh, within their valuation themselves, though my valuation is not really going to be relying much on uh, that at all, uh, because like I said, Tanzania is not exactly a low risk environment in terms of its ge ge uh, geopolitical risks, um, though it is becoming more and more so of a friendly a place to operate in particular for American companies. Now, down here in some of these other slides, they talk about some of the other companies that have been operating in Tanzania recently, which is one of the reasons that there's cause to believe that this is becoming a much more uh, business friendly environment, especially for American business. Um, the United States signed a trade deal with Tanzania recently. Uh, Barrick, one of the other gold operators, BHP, a, uh, metals and other materials operators, Anglo Gold Ashanti and Total Energies and Shell have all had major investments in Tanzania recently. Um, and there's also been major investments in hydropower, uh, which uh, shows that there's increasing in, in uh, infrastructure, which will allow for uh, much more consistent operations, um, but also uh, potentially leading to lower cost operations in the future as well. 
All right, now let's move on and talk a little bit about the pricing analysis I did on the company. I was really just doing a pricing analysis on the silver industry in general. And so I did this uh, industry grouping of 29 companies within uh, the silver operating uh, industry. And I did correlations across a, a variety of pricing metrics as well as a variety of fundamental metrics, trying to find essentially which ones had the best uh, statistical strength in predicting uh, multiples uh, for different companies, and then trying to essentially price different companies against each other within this industry grouping. Now, one of the best multiples that I found uh, for making these uh, these multiple projections was the PE ratio and that correlated against gross margins uh, for these companies. Unfortunately, considering it's a trailing 12 month PE ratio, that meant there was a decent amount of companies that didn't actually uh, survive the sample since they didn't have positive earnings. So that's why you see not very many companies on this particular graph right here. Uh, but nonetheless, the year, here you can see a positive correlation between gross margins and PE ratios given for the companies. And then we have uh, SVM down here marked in purple uh, showing a relatively low PE ratio relative to its high gross margin against the other companies here. I also priced uh, EV to sales relative to net margins, as you can see right here. And likewise, you can see SVM significantly uh, higher net margins relative to the low EV to sales that you see against the, the companies in the sample. And then also we did price to book versus operating margins. Likewise, SVM is underpriced on this metric as well. And if I take a weighted average against all the pricing metrics that I included and then show the entire sample against that, um, and this particular graph, it ends up being flipped where you actually want to be on the upside of it because we're showing a total pricing upside on the uh, y-axis right here and the market cap against the, the x-axis right here. So you can see that SVM is a relatively small company that is significantly underpriced. So we're noting that the uh, x-axis is on a log scale. So right here we have about 500 million uh, in market cap and a significant underpricing. It shows almost 400% right here, but you shouldn't actually necessarily assume that that's the type of returns you're going to get. Again, this is all just kind of a relative metric for seeing whether or not a company is cheap or not. The point is, is that against all these different metrics, it looks like SVM is cheap relative to its peers. Now you could also make the argument that one of the reasons it would be cheap against its peers is perhaps some of the risks in the operations it has, as well as some of the, the things that it needs to prove for those operations as well. Um, but, but the point is, is that was one of the things that set me looking at SVM in the first place as I was doing a pricing analysis on silver and found that one to be essentially the most underpriced. And then I found it to be a decent value as well. Now, coming over here to taking a look at some of the technical dynamics related to the company as well, I wanted to point out its trend in short interest for the last couple of years uh, has been trending upward, both as a percentage of the short being floated, as well as the days to cover, uh, both being well above their average over the last couple of years. Um, not necessarily extreme levels per se, really just only at, you know, like two and a half percent or something like that in a few days, uh, but still high relative to its average. Um, that's also decently oversold on a daily RSI basis, though it's pretty middling in terms of the weekly and the monthly basis as well. Um, analyst ratings have stayed consistently within the, the buy territories. There was some people who had a hold rating that dropped out of that hold rating, uh, but they didn't seem to jump into the buy category or the sell category. They just kind of seemed to disappear from the count altogether. Uh, the targets the analysts have had have been drifting upward over the last couple of years, um, though the, the range of the targets have also gotten a little bit wider. Uh, and then the ratio of the stock price to the target has actually gotten wider, showing that there's potential upside if the analyst estimates can be trusted in any, in any sense whatsoever. All right, now coming over to take a look at the model that I built for the company. Uh, this model is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to try to kind of point out some of the most important factors uh, and, and really kind of just kind of move past some of the more complicated elements of it because I don't want to get bogged down in some of the details of how it's put together. Um, but for the most part, what you can see right here is that we have the uh, average price within the year for the different commodities that they sell. Now, I primarily focus on talking about silver because that is the, the pretty large bulk, more than 50% of their business. But I did mention that they also have other base metals that they sell. Those include lead and zinc. And then they have a, a relatively small portion of existing gold sales within their business already as well uh, before the project that they're going to be taking on. So I have average prices for within the year for the last decade for all four of those commodities right here. Um, and then we have the production levels for their Chinese operations as well. And then we've uh, made 
uh, projections of based off of the averages over the last decade of how much we assume those productions are going to continue into the future. Um, now, within their own guidance, they're actually guiding for higher levels of production, at least in terms of the silver operations. So we could be underestimating um, how much operations for silver production they're going to have for the next few years or so, possibly based off of that. Um, but we're making our assumptions that the reserves that they currently have are reflective of how much resources they're going to be able to mine in the future in total. And so we don't really think it matters necessarily too much how much they do in one year. At the end of the day, they have the total amount of reserves they have and they're going to make them make their way through the reserves one way or the other. So um, if you go at a faster rate, that means you have less years after the 10-year projection period. That's kind of the way we look at it. Um, so the point is, is um, with the production levels that they have, as well as the prices that we saw on average within the year, that gets you kind of an implied sales if they were to sell all the ore that they mined based on that within the years there. And then you add that up to get kind of an implied level of revenue for the company. And then I have their actual revenue listed right here. The uh, reason why I do that is because then the ratio between the two gives us uh, a ratio that reflects the royalty costs that they pay to the, the country, as well as any um, hedging costs that are within there, as well as any stockpiling that gets reflected within that as well. And so this ratio is important for actually kind of bearing down on a, a more reflective number for the revenues uh, in the 10 year forward period as well. Now here I have a table kind of showing their reserves for their Chinese operations. Uh, when you're looking at natural resource reserves, um, they tend to get split into different categories based off of um, the uh, probability uh, that the estimates are, are accurate based off of the geological surveys, as well as also the uh, economic feasibility of taking those uh, those materials out of the ground in the first place. So it's kind of like two dimensions upon which they tend to divide uh, the, the way they think about resources. Um, so there's proven, probable, measured, indicated, and inferred. And essentially at each one of those gets a little bit further away on both of those axes um, um, outward. And so the way I, I'm thinking about this is that essentially uh, there's 100% of the proven materials that we know we're gonna be able to use. Probable, we're assuming about 10% less of that. And then we're assuming there's gonna be a 20% scale down after that. So maybe 70% of the measured materials will be used. We'll assume a 30% scale down after that. So that only 40% of the indicated materials get used. And then we're assuming a 40% scale down after that, which means that therefore 0% of the inferred resources, we're gonna assume that they actually just can't pull those out of the ground altogether. So then over here, we have essentially our weighted average of how much um, total resources we assume they can actually pull out based off of that. This is just me kind of using some ratios to kind of come up with the numbers here. It's possible they can do better than this. It's possible that they can do worse than this. Um, but that's the way I like to think about natural resource reserves. And then the way I like to think about this is that you can kind of take the, the average production levels that they had um, or, or are going to have in the future based off the averages that we were projecting for. And then you can subtract that from the, the reserves or the, the weighted average reserve number we have right here for 10 years. And then whatever's left at the end there, you can divide by um, the annual level to essentially say, this is how many years you would have left of this resource um, after the 10 year uh, projection period. So I have those numbers listed right here um, for the natural resources. And then the weighted average for all the resources based off of the production level, um, basically in the bear case, maybe they have 28 years of operations left. The bull case, maybe 13 years of operations left. And uh, base case, maybe 17 to 18 years of operations left. Okay, so that's kind of our ways of projecting for the total resources that they would have available here. Again, uh, in their table, they said they would have maybe a few years less than that than I'm estimating here. But like I said before, they also estimated that they'd have their production levels higher. So by me pushing those uh, production further out into the future, I'm actually lowering the present value. So that's actually just one way of being conservative. Um, so now within that, then the, uh, I also included a lot of their profitability metrics, the EBIT, uh, reinvestment levels, and appreciation levels, trying to work down to the free cash flow levels, all just trying to essentially assess their average um, profitability levels relative to those EBITDA margins that we were seeing in the uh, the chart. All this to essentially try to get some estimate of where I think uh, free cash flows can be um, both in the uh, terminal year as well as on average over the 10 year period. Um, now. I have uh, done live streams where I've shown uh, my my projections for commodity prices uh, that I use for my my valuations, which I'll probably have something here uh, near the top of the screen showing you where one of these that you can find might process for this. And I use my the upper bound of my projections for commodity prices for the bullish estimate of my price uh, prices for the future. So when I see silver, gold, lead, and zinc prices here in the bullish estimate, these are projections that I came up with, and these are the upper bound of the projections I came up with.
for my bear estimate for the commodity prices, I actually rely on a longer term average of the of the historic numbers uh, to get an estimate of that. And then I rely on um, a, a downward movement in the the estimate to uh, to basically be a little bit more conservative than even the historic estimates have shown me. So when you see the bear case estimate for silver, gold, and lead and zinc right here, that's where those numbers came from. And then the base numbers is essentially just the average between the, the bear and the bull case estimate. So this is my projection for the commodity prices. For the years in the 10 year period in between, I'm just going to assume that it's essentially halfway between what the, the current price is and this estimate right here. Okay, and then the same thing for the production. I'm going to assume that the it's going to be an average between what the current production level is and what my assessment of the production level is going to be going forward. Uh, and so with that, I end up getting assessments for what what I think the average revenues are going to be, both for the ten years in between as well as the the into perpetuity, and then likewise for the free cash flows as I was talking about. Now. That's the Chinese operations. Um, we have the Tanzania operations to take into account. Um, in some ways, the, they're more difficult. In some ways, they're easier. Um, we don't have any historic numbers to look at when it comes to Tanzania production. We just have the, the average estimate that they have for production levels of getting up to 234,000 ounces of gold production. Uh, so we're going to assume, uh, based off of the uh, deviations in the production levels that they saw in their historic numbers on their Chinese production levels, that they, it, it's possible that if they outperform, it could maybe be as much as 19% higher on their annual production levels in the perpetuity year. Uh, in the worst case scenario, possibly twice as much to the downside of that, which would be 38% worse than their projection, projection levels, which would be 146,000 ounces in the bear case to possibly 278,000 ounces per year in the bull case. And then and halfway in between that is our base case estimate right there. And then I have my gold price projection, proje uh, projections already. I'm going to use the uh, ratio for royalty assessment that we already came up with for the Chinese operations as well. And that gets me down to revenue levels for the Tanzania operations as well. Um, now we use the same a method we talked about with the resource reserves for the Chinese reserves on the Tanzanian reserves as well to come up with an estimate of how many years of operations that they would have into perpetuity as well for, for the Tanzania operations. And it's anywhere between 30 years of production and 10 years of production, uh, 17 in our base case. And then we have to make cost assumptions for Tanzania as well. This is the part that's a little bit tricky because we don't have any historic numbers to rely on. So what I chose to do is to go over to Barrick Gold, which is the other gold owner that I happen to own uh, and also operates in Tanzania. And I went to take a look at what their um, cost of sales per ounce uh, was like. And then I chose to rely on the, a wider range around those estimates uh, for uh, uh, Silver Corp. And then I uh, projected those numbers in the future based off of inflation rates. Then I relied on average SGNA levels uh, as well as EBIT margin levels uh, and DNA levels based off of the gold industry uh, at large, which could be a very conservative estimate considering those averages are weighed down by a lot of negative outliers within the, the gold mining industry. Um, so it's possible that I'm being too conservative within my, my cost assumptions here, um, but that, that's one thing that we're, we'll have to wait till first gold to see what the actual the actual margins are like. But the point is, is for the Tanzania, Tanzania numbers, we can then make projections for what uh, the free cash flows would end up looking like uh, both in the 10 years in between, as well as the, the perpetuity numbers like we did with the Chinese numbers. And now that we've done that for both uh, geographic regions of their operations, we can then combine those two together. Uh, so essentially, what we end up with is uh, for the 10 year period in between anywhere from 200 and 800 million in revenue In the perpetuity we see between 300 and 1200 in revenue uh, and then free cash flows for the 10 year in between is anywhere between 33 and 114 million in free cash flows. And then in perpetuity, it's anywhere between negative four and 152 million in free cash flows, uh, leaving uh, a weighted average of perpetuity uh, production years between both of their operations between 29 and 11 years, uh, to which then I, I take an, uh, an estimate of how many, what type of return that they would expect on that to essentially turn these into multiples that I will use for my terminal multiple for the company. The way I look at that is that essentially they would be trying to get anywhere between a one for one return and a doubling of a return based off of the risk that they see within that. And then that would make it so that if they bought the company at a multiple of 12.7 at the perpetuity year, they would be able to get this many years of production and get their rate of return. Um, so with all that, this is my model for the company. 
you can come over here to my DCF template to see where I put all this together. Uh, in the short run, we have the revenue uh, estimates going in line with the analyst estimates, and then they're moving towards uh, in the perpetuity year, the numbers that we saw that we reflected in our model, both on average over the 10 year period, as well as the actual uh, 10 year forward numbers. And you can see the cumulative growth cases here. There's some situations where we see revenue going down and then moving into growth eventually. And then in some cases where we see uh, both volume, uh, uh, their, their new operations, as well as the commodity prices spiking dramatically in the short run, leveling off a little bit and then moving the future. And then there's a middling path as well. Incremental growth cases you can see right here. Coming over to the operating margins, this part is a little bit tricky uh, to, to explain, but it, it makes sense if you understand um, accounting to a certain extent. In the short run, they're going to maintain the relatively high operating margins as their uh, Chinese operations uh, continue to roll at full steam. And then as they move into the new operations, as well as uh, some of their other operations start to um, get um, moved downward, they should actually go into some years where they're going to have significant operating losses on a gap basis. So we've seen huge negative margin returns in the operating margin basis right here. But again, this is more of a gap figure. Don't freak out too much about it. Um, what that does actually do for them is cause them to save a significant amount of tax savings because of the fact that they're not, they're going to be taxed on their taxable income and they'll actually have negative taxable income within those years. Then coming over to the reinvestment levels uh, to go against the uh, massive negative operating margins, they're actually going to have massive negative reinvestment in those years as well. And so what that's going to do is that's going to create positive cash flows within those years. So gap operating losses for several years, but with positive free cash flows. Um, and that's um, backed off of the, the high reinvestment they actually have in the, the first couple of years. So high reinvestment in the short run moved into massive negative uh, reinvestment, massive deinvestment uh, from their Chinese operations, uh, essentially, and then moving back into a more stable level of reinvestment into perpetuity. Coming down here, um, that actually makes the return on invested capital uh, quartiles really go insane. So honestly, you can, for the most part, ignore this figure since it, it's, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a confusing metric, uh, probably for well over a decade. Uh, but the capital investment quartiles, I think this makes a and reflects exactly what I was talking about. High reinvestment levels up front, then moving into net re, uh, de uh, investment and then moving back into decent reinvestment levels right here. Keep in mind that there's actually a decent amount of uh, depreciation and amortization that makes up the, the reinvestment right here because of those EBITDA margins. But uh, free cash flows into perpetuity you can see in the distribution approximately right here. Then to go with that, we have to make an assessment for the discount rates. In the short run, we have the discount rate reflecting their Chinese operations. And then in the, the perpetuity year, we have it reflecting uh, them having a majority Tanzania operations, which means a massive increase in their discount rate over the 10 year period. Um, but they do end up with having relatively high terminal growth rates uh, to make the, the implied terminal multiple come back up to the reflected level that we are talking about for their natural resources. But that makes sense because they'll essentially still be uh, going full strength with those new operations. So they have lots of growth ahead of them into perpetuity at that point. Uh, but with that terminal multiple in that 11.7 that range as we were talking about, that gets us into our fair value of about $3.35 right here with a range of anywhere from $2 to about $4.50. So a very wide range for the interquartile range right here. Uh, you can see that there's some downside to that first quartile range. So there is some price risk potentially under some of the worst circumstances right here, uh, but the expected returns are just outrageous within that uh, because of this the skew within the value as you can see right here some circumstances where it technically becomes worthless, but a relatively small percentage within that. And I think I'm actually being very conservative in, as I said, some of the estimates relating to uh, the margins, as well as the uh, the spin-up of operations for the revenue growth cases, uh, as well as a few, a few other factors. It's so coming over here to the summary page. You can see the summary of all, all of these estimates as I was talking about uh, coming in right here. Uh, it's currently trading at the 36th percentile of the distribution of value that I created with about 38% of upside and 18.4% expected returns for the next decade. So very, very strong expected returns. It is worth noting that a decent amount of those expected returns do come from the discount rate. Uh, so it is uh, decently expected to be volatile under that basis, like uh, on, on average about 14.7%. So, you know, that really means it's about three to 4% of, of alpha uh, expected return within that and a decent amount of beta volatility is expected within that, but still a decent amount of skew within that distribution as I was talking about. So if I'm wrong to the upside, there could be a disproportionate amount of upside returns within that. Please like the video. It's the best way you can help us with the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to the channel if you've not already. Also, consider joining our free Discord. The link is in the description below.
So that's going to do it for my overview of Silver Court Metals, SVM. I did already take a position within this company, um, partially because I feel really well backed up by the, the pricing analysis I did, as well as being very excited by this opportunity and really not wanting to miss it. And I've been very much wanting to have some silver exposure within my portfolio for some time and just hadn't been able to find the right one. Um, I do think I'm being pretty reasonably conservative on a lot of these factors. Um, so I think that leaves lots of positions uh, for me to, uh, to re-rate them to the upside once I see uh, some confirmation on some of these operations. Uh, but I'm very excited about this opportunity and I was very happy to share it with you guys as well. I'll catch you all in the next valuation. Bye.